So, um, new topic today. Uh, we'll start talking about contaminant transport as opposed to the motion of individual phases, as in multi-phase flow. So, I'll try and put it in perspective by way of uh, recap, but the, the topical areas. We'll talk about the different mechanisms of transport, uh, diffusion and advection, uh, right here, uh, individually in their uh, characteristics. And we'll talk about defining dispersion as a mechanism for contaminants to spread in the, the subsurface. And so, uh, by way of introduction then, um, maybe we'll, this perhaps encapsulates many of the things. Too busy a slide, uh, but it includes much of the stuff that's relevant, I think, to what we're talking about. I can get rid of some of these things. Uh, just to make it less busy. Uh, but we've talked so far about uh, the motion of fluids as individual phases, uh, specifically for maybe when we drop uh, gasoline or a denser than water solvent in the subsurface. We know that they behave differently in that one will go below the water table and one will not be buoyed by it, uh, as shown in the right figure here. Um, we know that they will segregate and distribute themselves in different saturations. Uh, we understand that because of capillary models for how those fluids are held in place by their capillary interfacial forces. And we can characterize that behavior in two modes. One in its distribution and how it's held through the capillary pressure versus saturation concepts. The diagram on the bottom right, all scrawled out, but you know exactly what that is. Um, and the, the rate at which fluids will flow, uh, and through our understanding of uh, relative permeability curves, and well, I guess I did remove it, but I guess I could get it back again. Ah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so, so we talked about things in terms of relative permeabilities. And so often we talk about that in terms of the motion of those two fluids. One could be the oil phase and one could be the water phase that's moving. Uh, or one could be the water phase that's moving uh, with the residual oil phase, which isn't moving. Um, and so in our quest to understand this behavior, I suppose uh, our interest is in understanding exactly what the distribution of these fluids are, which we think we know we can do. And the other part is if they were held there by capillary forces and they're not going anywhere, then it wouldn't be a problem to us if they didn't dissolve. So we've talked about immiscible flow, where they don't mix. Uh, miscible flow is where they dissolve slightly in water. And so for our purposes, that is to look at this down gradient plume that comes out. Uh, we know that uh, through these chimneys of residual saturation, uh, if we're below the water table, as we are here, we'll get water flow. And that water flow will carry with it uh, a mass flux of water, uh, which we can get from our understanding of relative permeabilities, if we know what the gradients are, and get relatively predictable methods of that if we know what the permeability is, and if we estimate the relative permeability from the saturation from our X plots, um, and whatever the hydraulic gradient would be. Here, ostensibly, the hydraulic gradient is zero. It's dead flat. Uh, and so it'd be zero. But if it has some gradient to it, it'd be flowing. And we could calculate the volumetric flux of water. And if we wanted to know the uh, mass flux of dissolved component removed, we can just multiply that water flux by whatever the concentration of that uh, dissolved component is. And so that will give us something uh, to be able to uh, design, if you like, or understand exactly what's going on with our system. OK, great. So I didn't go back to the beginning. So our task is to, to take that now, the next step, and look at the behavior of the uh, miscible fluids. And I guess there are perhaps two things that we would be interested to do. Actually, some you've done already. So we've already talked about residence time distributions, RTD curves. And uh, I guess we've talked about velocities being equal to this. And I guess a relative permeability on top of that. 
and that's the Darcy velocity. We've talked about advective velocities being the Darcy velocity divided by porosity, and you've used that. Porosity values can be very small, 10%, 30% typically, but they can be very small in fractured media. And so that has allowed us to be able to figure out exactly what this is. And with that, I think you've done some calculations. If you have this chimney, you can imagine having the chimney with the puddle on the bottom of it. You have water flowing here at an advective velocity. You can calculate what the distribution of that looks like as it goes downstream. And uh, depending on how you want to think about these, relative concentrations given by this, uh, and just from the definition of velocity as a length over time, you can get from that a length traveled in a given time is equal to the advective velocity times time. So that's what you've assumed. And that's probably not a bad assumption. It gives us an ability to be able to make some calculations, and, and that's true. And so I guess what we'd like to do now is we'd like to examine whether this is really true. Probably largely true, but it's certainly not true in all cases. Because I guess you could imagine the case where you have diffusion or dispersion. And if that's the case, then you might expect that the uh, distribution of um, concentrations might be uh, skewed around the front. Uh, this skew being because flow down little tiny thin channels that faster velocities would kind of move it out ahead. And if it's moving out ahead, then there's not so much to move behind. So that might be one thing. And I guess the other one, so this would be, say, arrivals at Long Street. And I guess it's also arrivals, but the other one might be concentrations. And so we've mentioned the fact that mass concentration, the amount of dissolved mass that's arriving, might be equal to the volumetric flux of water multiplied by whatever its concentration is, mass per unit volume. Uh, milligrams per liter, etc. cetera. Um, but this relies on the fact that the concentration is the same as the maximum solubility in, in water. And that begs the question is, as it travels through this little chimney that's partly uh, residual saturation, does it reside in here long enough to take up this full concentration? So I guess we're questioning as to whether this amount here is the right concentration, and we're questioning whether this arrival time, or this is an arrival time here, delta t, is the correct arrival time if we're sitting here. So that's kind of what we'd like to, to deal with. And so this characterization that you've already used is absolutely OK so long as it's plug flow. Uh, but as soon as it stops being plug flow, and I suppose you could imagine if you have in plan view, some kind of site with a source here, and it's flowing downstream, then if you idealize that as a, whoops, flow within a core, then you can imagine that the concentration distribution along that core would look just like this. So I guess I wasn't going to draw it, just getting too involved all over the place today. So the concentration on that core might look something like this, I suppose. Mimicking this behavior here. But if it, in plan view, if you're looking at this as a site, you could imagine the, the contours of concentration for this plume might look like this. Because it's coming from a source. It's not coming from a source that completely covers the one-dimensional system. And so the question is, if it's forced to do this, will the concentration be at some high value along the length, or is it going to look something like 
something much more precipitous, I guess. So that instead of looking like this here, that this concentration is reduced. And so looking at diffusion and dispersion is an important thing for us to look at in terms of material properties. And I guess this is kind of a geometric feature, right? It's not due to any of those properties. It's just a matter that the, the flow is spreading out in 3D and idealizing it as a 1D flow is perhaps not a very good um, way to characterize it. So, so we have to look at the mechanisms by which it's transported. And there's two main ones, uh, diffusion and dispersion and advection. Uh, you've, and we'll deal with those in due course uh, in the stuff that we'll talk about. And so that, you will know what these things are, of course. So advection is what you've done already. So it's the rate at which it gets carried downstream. So the easiest way to explain how these things fit together in terms of advection and both diffusion and mechanical dispersion is to think about this uh, analog. Diffusion, of course, is when I wear my aftershave and you can smell it. It diffuses through the air and you can smell it in your nostrils. Uh, it takes a certain amount of time to get there. And of course, none of the characterizations you used with advection would be able to take care of that mechanism. Uh, you can't use this expression to be able to evaluate it. So understanding exactly what diffusion is uh, and relative to dispersion is perhaps useful. So the an analog I always use is you take a beaker. Uh, I sit with a beaker. I drop a, a drop of ink into it. it. Maybe there's milk in the beaker. And if you took a, um, a profile of concentration, across that drop, it would look like the blue profile here, be Manhattan. It would be a skyscraper. The concentration gradient on the side would be infinite. Uh, nature abhors infinite gradients, so it would try and spread it out by diffusion. And so it would spread out. And over time, if I left it, it would start looking like the red one first. And then after infinite time, I suppose it would look like this. It would be a uniform. If it's blue ink, it would be a light blue uh, color within the whole system, and it would be uniform. If I wanted to, I could take that beaker, drop the ink in, and walk across the room, and so that it would travel across the room, and it would accommodate diffusion as it moves across there. And so it would look like this red profile as I got to the other side of the room. I could also do that as kind of a thought experiment in dropping the ink in here and moving it to some other location. And so it, it takes 10 seconds to get it here, uh, a meter a second to get 10 meters across the room. I guess the room's not 10 meters wide. But by the time I got to the other side, it would look like this diffusion, diffusive profile here. And so the way that all of groundwater hydrology deals with diffusion and dispersion is to lump them all together. And you can lump them all together because if you didn't know that in getting from the upstream to the downstream and this having to go through those tortuous flow paths and spreading out as a result, um, you wouldn't, uh, if you didn't know that it went through that, you wouldn't be able to tell this profile here different from the diffusive profile here. So dispersion just happens to look like diffusion. And so they're typically lumped together. They follow the same physical laws and we can lump them together, albeit by different processes. And so we'll divide it up into two processes. So diffusion is molecular diffusion, uh, follows fixed law. Dispersion is due to the fact that if you start off at this point here, as you move downstream, those particles have the ability to go in multiple bifurcated directions. And therefore, what it looks like when it gets downstream is this distribution. And it just happens to look the same as these two things after you've moved it. And so we can talk about including diffusion and dis dispersion together. And we quantify that together, the two components, is hydrodynamic dispersion. Or sometimes this is mechanical dispersion. So we'll deal with it in two forms. Uh, I'm not super worried that you understand the equations that we develop. Um, at some stage in your career, you'll come across them again. We don't really need them in this course. We'll use them, talk about what they mean, and solve them and use the solutions to those solution, to those equations, but we won't really develop those solutions ourselves. You must have seen fixed first law. 
it really relates to the fact that you can drive a mass flux. So this is the mass flux of uh, dissolved gasoline moving within the water by diffusion. It's driven by the concentration gradient, just like Darcy flow is driven by the pressure or head gradient, and it operates through the molecular diffusion coefficient. Uh, it looks like this. You start off with a dense, uh, uh, an infinite concentration. As time goes on, it gets rid of that, and at successive times, it would end up getting flatter and flatter. The formal law is that the flux occurs in the opposite direction to which the gradient occurs. This is a positive gradient here. And the flow from that positive gradient is in the negative x direction. I guess the x has gone off here. So that's the reason for this negative sign, just like uh, uh, flow in Darcy's law. And you can look at the various um, definitions of the individual components. Concentration is mass per unit volume, as we've talked about before. And what we could do is we could write a conservation law that says, basically, mass in minus mass out equals accumulation. I think you might have seen that before. Mass accumulation. It's not mass of water because the water could be static, or mass of air. Actually, this is air. This is more akin to transport and air. Um, but in the air, we're, our porosity in this room, I guess, is 100%, so we don't have to worry about it. But if we're talking about this motion in a porous medium, we have to worry the fact that the diffusion only occurs in the portion of our porous medium, which is water or air filled. If we throw this flux into here and rearrange it, we get fix second law, which is this. Second order PDE says that the mass rate of accumulation is given by the diffusion coefficient times the second partial derivative of concentration. And so that, in our case, since we've flown this away as one, represents you smelling my aftershave in this room. If we fill the room up with sand uh, and look at the transport, then we have to deal with the fact that the flow now is only within the pore space of our pores medium. And so if we want to use fixed law, we have to do two things. We might want to have to include this porosity. And we might want to have to modify this because it can't diffuse directly from me to you in a straight line, line of sight. But in getting from upstream to downstream, it has to go on some tortuous path. And so this diffusion uh, bell curve, this normal Gaussian distribution, which is the, the solution to this second order PDE, it's just like a, a normal probability distribution, now has to flow in the interstices of this porous medium. And so the path lengths become longer. And so the diffusion that we include has to be corrected for this tortuosity. And so omega is just a tortuosity that modifies this. You'd expect that because it makes it go a longer path, that it's less efficient at transport. So it take the, the magnitude of this textbook, reference book, uh, molecular diffusion, and reduce it by some amount. So it should be less than one. And we can get some numbers of this and throw those in. And we could come up with some rational ways of doing that. And so the diffusion coefficient that we might want to use would be this, which would be modified in some way. If we want to solve this expression, what we could do is we could take that um, drop of um, uh, ink, put it in a beaker, and we could represent turning on that drop at time zero by a step function, so-called heaviside function, and then solve for the diffusion from that point. So we'd be solving essentially this equation. We start off with the skyscraper. That represents the concentration at time t0. After time t0, we, I, we keep that skyscraper constant, and we allow this concentration gradient to change. At time 1, it would look like this. At time 2, it would look like this. At time 3, it would look like this. 
was one way to look at it. So this is if we kept this concentration constant. Alternatively, if we put in a drop of ink and just had that isolated drop of ink there without any connection to the outside world, we'd think that at time one it would look like this, but at time two it would look like this. Because that mass of ink is finite and it can't be added to. And so if you think about it, this area under this curve should equal the same area as under the square curve here, kind of. It's a bit different because it's spreading in all three directions, but roughly we're conserving mass. A drop of ink goes in. Uh, since the mass is conserved, its concentration at peak must go down because it's spreading out in the skirts at its lat lateral transfer. But if we solve the second order PDE, which is here, which we won't do, we end up with a expression which gives us the concentration as a function of location and time. It turns out to be the complementary error function, which is a function on your calculator you could use. And the distance traveled in one dimension would be x away from the source. This would be the characteristic diffusion coefficient. And we've already said that should be equal to the one you get from the textbook multiplied by some uh, tortuosity, some reduction factor, and the time since you dropped the bead, the bead in. And so this is what it would look like. Uh, this is, you'd probably think of as a cumulative probability distribution. And so in other words, this is the, the mean here, and this is a standard deviation about this mean. Um, the other way to draw it would be to draw it as a real bell curve, that they're equivalent to each other. And it would look like this. Oops. Don't know why I'm using fuchsia today, but I am. This would, you think this would be the frequency. How many students get a B plus, right? It's typically the, the um, grading. This would be B plus, this would be an A, this would be a C. And this would be something like, this would be three standard deviations, three sigma. And this would be so three sigma includes something, I don't know, is it 97% of the population lives within three sigma of the mean? This would be the mean value at this concentration. So the, this concentration value here would be the average of whatever it is. So this is just the cumulative. So if, in other words, if you started off at this point here and went through here, then this would be, this, I guess, one minus. So the complementary function is just equal to 1 minus. So I guess it would be starting here. This would be 100%. This would be 0%. This is the mean, which is this point here. And if you only went one standard deviation, I can't remember. Does anyone remember what one standard deviation is? Is it 66%? I can't remember. I, I digress in this. It's not particularly important, but I'm doing it anyway. This would be one sigma on each side. And I think this area here would be 67%. I can't remember. But you get the idea. So it's, it's the so-called Gaussian distribution after Gauss. Must be a German mathematician, right? So that's diffusion. So if we had diffusion going on, uh, an aroma, move, whatever the source of the aroma, an aroma moving through the room would define that. And we will come back to this fact that we can think of diffusion and dispersion as being similar. So I guess what we've talked about so far is if we put the blob of ink in here, 
there was no horizontal motion of the water in here, this would be what it would look like as it spread out under its own concentration gradient, not being driven by advection. So that's what we've talked about so far. If we talk about advection, uh, you've done that already um, in terms of calculating the rates at which things arrive. We can define the Darcy velocity as being equal to this term here without the porosity. If we take the Darcy velocity uh, and divide by the porosity, we get the advective velocity. And I guess I could have just avoided doing that. So this is the advective velocity. Um, this term here I just ringed is the, uh, the Darcy velocity divided by porosity. So that says how quickly things will go downstream. Um, if we want to calculate the flux that's carried in the advection, it's equal to the advective velocity. It's actually equal to the Darcy velocity. So this term here is the Darcy velocity, right? The advective velocity times porosity is the Darcy velocity. So it gets a bit convoluted. Multiplied through by the convective flux. You remember what we did before when we talked about the mass flow rate being carried down. We said before that the mass flow rate is equal to the volumetric flux multiplied by concentration. If we multiply, if this is the area here, and we multiplied both sides here by this area, this term here would be the mass flow flow. This would be the area times the Darcy flux times concentration. And this term here is just Q. Not over Q, but Q. So that's the rationale. And so just as we did before, if we have this mass flux, we put it in our conservation equation uh, and look at what it looks like. And it comes out to look like this. So this is mass in minus mass out. It could be into a, a bucket, or it could be a little differential cube, and it's equal to mass accumulation. And so this equation is super easy to solve because you've solved it, and it is that it, the velocity is equal to length over time. And so indeed, the length traveled is equal to velocity times time. This has to be advective velocity. And this is advective velocity. It turns out super easy to solve like this. Actually, not very easy to solve using numerical models, which is kind of um, uh, ironic in some respects. And so you can think of it in terms of this. This is what you've done already. This is uh, turning on, this is dropping the bead of ink into water at concentration one. This is what happens as it goes downstream and is carried by the uh, advective ve velocity in the x direction of the fluid. The solution that we'd expect to get would be this red line for this particular boundary condition. If we had a different boundary condition where we suddenly introduced um, a bubble or a, an ink drop into the system and then didn't add any more ink drops and allowed that ink drop to be carried downstream, then the profile that it would look like would be this one. So these are two different boundary conditions in terms of time. One that's turned on and left on. So it's turned on at time zero and we keep on supplying ink. This one's turned on at time zero once and then we don't supply any more after it's moved downstream. And so these red curves would be exactly what we'd get if we were solving this equation here. But typically, we're interested in understanding the behavior we get if we mix it with this behavior here. And so you can imagine that if we have diffusion occurring as well, we would have these green curves. If we have little diffusion occurring about the front, it would be this first one. And if we have a lot of diffusion occurring, it would be this one. It would get rid of the gradient much faster. 
And of course, the analog to this would be that this would be if we have a little bit of diffusion, and this is if we had a lot. So I guess my terminology for that would be diffusion. This would be diffusion equals zero. This is diffusion a little bit. And this is diffusion a lot. And so the interesting things that we might hope for is that this maybe this location of the distribution is controlled by this length. Maybe, maybe not. And maybe this maximum concentration is also indicative of the upstream concentration. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. So those are perhaps two assumptions that we've thought about and we've, you've used. Uh, we can examine how valid they are. So going back to the point before is that we talked about diffusion so far. But we also want to add to that what we'll call dispersion, which is, and we, we called this hydrodynamic hydro dispersion. Bad writing. And so you can imagine some mechanisms by which we get this second phase. So dispersion is a mechanical effect. And it's due to the fact, as we go downstream, because we get this mixing, if we looked at the profile downstream, no longer would it be a distribution like this. Right. It would look like this bell curve. Gaussian distribution. Also, if you looked at the profile along here, it would look like this, a bit like what we've talked about here. And that is that as we go along the length, because this front is no longer sharp, uh, we would take some of the mass that existed before this, and we're basically redistributing this mass into this little part here. And you can think of it occurring for these mechanisms here. It could go down a superhighway, a fast flow path, where we know the permeability is faster because it, the pore sizes are more open. And so something that starts off here at the same location at time t0 will arrive here earlier than it would do here, right? Because it's traveling faster. And so if you took the profile of concentrations across this um, part here, you could imagine that it would look like this because the stuff hasn't arrived here yet. It could travel on a straight path or a tortuous path, and that would also give this effect. Or at even micro scale, you could think about it flowing within the individual capillaries. We know that the flow vo velocity distribution within a tube is a zero velocity boundary condition at the wall and a maximum velocity at the center of the tube, which is parabolic. And so something that starts off here will travel at zero velocity. Something that starts off here at time zero will travel at maximum velocity. So we'd expect the profile to be a maximum. The earliest arrival downstream would be in the middle. It would take much longer, infinitely long, I guess, for this point to arrive down. So those are all contributing reasons that it might arrive in a uh, diffuse form as it arrives downstream. And as we said before, our interest is in being able to characterize this behavior because it looks like diffusion-like. And what we typically do is we characterize this mechanical diffuse dispersion as equal to a coefficient multiplied by its velocity. And that is to say that there's some parameter that really explains how wide this spread occurs, because a bigger value of this would, would mean what? I guess it would mean a bigger value of this would mean that the, the distribution would get progressively flatter. Right? So this green one would be d big. This red one would be d small. And so this here would scale. This is a property that defines 
the geometry of our porous medium. This says that if it flows faster, we'd expect it to spread out more, observed empirically, and that's why it's done. And so these individual components are referred to as a longitudinal one. and transverse. Yeah, it's not that, it's quite bright. And so that means that the longitudinal dispersion is, I guess, this one. This is proportional to alpha L. Yes, okay. And transverse dispersion is alpha t. How, how wide it expands in the lateral direction. And this is kind of uh, accommodating also that first plot we looked at today. So we said that if we had a, a, a bird's eye view of a, a landfill, say, we might think that the contours of the plume would look like this. And that's exactly what this diagram on the left is looking like. Concentration versus distance, something like this. And something like this. That's all. So that, that explains that. And I suppose the one thing to remember here is that the velocity you should be using is the velocity in the x direction. Right? Because if you think about this flow system, the velocity in the x direction is vx, but the velocity in the y direction is zero. Right? So it's always the velocity in the maximum direction, or in the direction of flow. And so even though you're characterizing the transverse dispersion, how much it's spreading out laterally, it's the longitudinal velocity that's used here. So that makes sense. Because otherwise, this velocity is 0, right? And therefore, this would be 0. And so typically, what we'd like to do, since we're adding these two effects together, going back to this very first point we made, so we want to add both molecular diffusion and mechanical dispersion together, then we just add the two effects because they look the same. And if we do that, we end up with these expressions here. So this defines our dispersion. This is the part due to diffusion, molecular diffusion. And this is the part due to mechanical dispersion. I guess they're written above. I could have just drawn arrows. But they're written in the wrong order, I guess. Yeah, so we've explained. So this is the direction of flow. This is the velocity in the direction of flow. These are the magnitudes of these dispersions in the two orthogonal directions. But always, we would use the advective velocity in the maximum in the direction of flow, because the perpendicular one is zero, obviously. And so this expression automatically gives the conditions that we'd expect. And so if we have materials which have super low permeabilities, so if permeability is very low, then from Darcy's law, advective velocity irrespective of the pressure gradient. If permeability is low, advective velocity is low. Advective velocity is low. And the only parameter that controls this is diffusion. So d star would be finite, I suppose. And alpha l 
V advective would go to zero, just from this equation. And so when you put radioactive waste in the ground and you put bentonite around it, which is a clay, which has a very low uh, velocity and also works as a good sor sorbing agent, has a very low velocity, and therefore all the transport in that would be by diffusion and not by advection, which is great because diffusion is typically very small. So values of D star, if you look them up for my aftershave uh, moving in the room, would be something like 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second. Very sm turns out to be a small number. But if this value is 0, then this becomes a big number compared to the other one. Conversely, in areas where water can flow, where k is not equal to zero, then advective velocity is big, then we have to worry about alpha L V is not equal to zero, and D star would go to zero, approximately. And so by using this expression, it automatically takes care of those two end member cases. When in clays, this will dominate because it'll be finite and this will be zero. In gravels and sands and fractured rocks, this term will be big. And this term will still be non-zero, but it doesn't matter because it's tiny compared to the rest of it. And so that's how we can think of things. And so in using that, we can use it to represent the behavior uh, because it takes care of those two end member conditions. Oh, we're, going, we're going like gangbusters through this. So the final thing we could think about would be um, in defining, uh, we haven't done it. I'm surprised we didn't do it here. I will do it. I'm going to go and do it. And so the final thing that we would come up with would be that we would define an expression and uh, we can put those terms together. It's a dispersion equation. And we now have, every, I'm not in, uh, worried that you know what the terms of this equation are, but it would look something, well, it would look something like this. D2 CDX squared plus transverse D2 C dy squared minus v d c d x times d no forget that And so this represents the system that we drew before. This is the x direction. This is the y direction. This is your hazardous waste site. This is what the plume looks like as you go downstream. Um, this represents This concentration behavior, C over C zero, not doesn't go up. This kind of summarizes everything we've talked about today. And that this expression here would be equal to what? Don't we say? Alpha L advective velocity in the maximum direction 
plus d star. This would be alpha transverse advective velocity in the maximum direction. I guess it would be x, right? Plus d star. This would be v sub x. And it is the effective velocity. And in terms of what these terms represent, accumulation equals mass in minus mass out. Um, and I guess this was equal to d times omega. This is molecular diffusion. So this was how quickly gasoline diffuses in water. Uh, it might be different from the 10 to the minus 9. I think that was a air, uh, gaseous diffusion, rather aqueous diffusion. So this would be the number you get out of a um, Reference text, bless you. This would be modified for tortuosity, or perhaps you measure this directly. This would be a characteristic of our porous medium. We'll find out that uh, alpha L is equal to the length of the plume divided by 10, which might be a surprising number. which we perhaps won't talk about today. But if you, uh, the reason for this is that um, this dispersion is really a, a function of how disordered the porous medium is. The more disordered it is, the more mixing you get. And therefore, uh, you'd expect this value of this dispersion to increase with the more potential you have to have mixing. And the fact that this might scale with the length of the plume means that if you have a very small plume, it only sees a little packet of porous medium, and it doesn't see any big features like big faults in there, which might exist at much larger scales. And so the heterogeneity it sees only at small scale is quite small, and therefore the spreading you expect from this might be quite small. As the plume gets much bigger, it gets to sample much bigger features that make the, the fluid flow fast, like faults and fractures, and therefore this term um, automatically changes. You, you think that it should be a, a material property, but a material property that changes as the scale of the plume gets larger isn't really a material property. It describes the behavior, but it's not really a material property. And so we'll use this as our understanding of what's going on, and we'll find out that this behavior, that in terms of these coefficients, really does describe the response for the different boundary conditions that we've talked about here, these two different boundary conditions. And I guess there's not enough room on this page, but what you have drawn already is another residence time distribution, which would look like this. Right? This is your long street curve concentration versus time. So this is the input into the, the flow regime. This is what it looks like in the core as you go from upstream to downstream. This would be a compliance point that is slowly, inexorably moving towards. And the sampling at the downstream location down here would look like this. Right? This is what you had. It would take some time to reach there. And what is it? Velocity is equal to length over time. So time would be equal to length over velocity, if I just rearrange that. So this should be length over advective velocity, right? That's what this term is. So we'll use a lot these three different, car this cartoon representation the upstream boundary condition going into the core. This represents flow 
along the core, exactly what it looks like. And then if we tap the core at the other end, this is the input boundary condition, this is the output boundary condition, resulting condition, and this is what it looks like in transit. And so the final um, component is to kind of rationalize exactly why we can get away by using an expression that looks like this. And so what we could do for the longitudinal uh, dispersion is do this thought experiment where we take a core to the lab and we put in this core in the lab exactly this upstream boundary condition. We turn it on and we leave it turned on and we wait for this plume to arrive at the downstream and we calculate from the arrival of this plume what this dispersion coefficient would be. And of course this dispersion coefficient, if it's plug flow, it will look exactly like this. If it's not plug flow, as dispersion progressively gets worse and worse, this would be d small and this would be d large. You see it? That's quite large. Yeah. And so we could use this to calculate what the dispersion in this system would be. And if we did that and we plotted that together, we could take this expression here, we could divide both sides through by the molecular diffusion. Someone's phone gone. By definition, this is one, right? So you can imagine that if you looked at different materials, we're going to plot this term, which is this, which we can measure. So imagine that we can measure the diffusion coefficient in the soil. And we can plot this as a function of velocity. So the velocity is 0. And the velocity is big. Then we get this. If the velocity is 0, this term is 0. And so it doesn't play. So we'd expect this term exactly to be 1. And so if I use a blunt instrument, we get this curve here. So we get a portion of this curve, right? Because these data look like they align along this curve. As we get larger and larger velocities, say above a velocity happens in this case to be a velocity of 1. So above this threshold, to the right of this, all of a sudden this number becomes large. This number is not changing, so it would keep on going here. So we add to this. And so this term here merely becomes the gradient of this. And so it's merely saying what we said before. If you have a clay, the flow velocity is 0. You can apply as big a pressure gradient as you want, but Darcy's law will tell you that because the permeability is low, whatever pressure gradient you apply, this term here is going to be tiny. If this is tiny, this is tiny. And the only effect you'll see would be molecular diffusion, which would be these data points here. As you change the porous medium to be a sand or a gravel or something else, all of a sudden, if you increase the permeability, you can increase the velocity, increase the velocity, then all of a sudden the dispersion you, you measure will be larger. And so if we look at these curves here, Diffusion only would be this curve, although it's kind of an oxymoron, right? Because if it's diffusion, it can never get carried downstream by advection. So it will actually never arrive at this location. But if it's dispersing, then these green curves, if it's dispersing a little bit, then it'll be this uh, sharper one. And if it's dispersing a lot, it'll be this lower one. And our interpretation of this dispersion would be to give it a bigger mechanical dispersion as it gets flatter and flatter. That bigger mechanical dispersion that we measure would be a, a data point would be, which would be up here rather than down here. 
So this would be dispersion small, this would be mechanical dispersion large, and the reason you're getting a large mechanical dispersion is because the velocity is going up as we go across here. So I'm not sure it adds to our understanding of this totally, but it at least gives a reason why this expression works. And these are just experimental results. These are data points where the, the magnitudes of the dispersion measured from those experiments is just plotted as a function of the flow velocity. We'll also find out, I suppose, that this term here is known as the Peclet number. Not very important for today. I think it has an accent in there. Don't know who Monsieur or Mademoiselle Peclet is, certainly French. And it's the ratio of uh, advective flux. We've used fx, that was what our flux was in our derivations, to dispersive flux. flux. Just like Reynolds' number is a ratio of inertial to viscous forces. So it's not just another dimensionless number, which is the ratio of two components happen to be fluxes. The flow that's driven by, that's carried by advection, or the mass that's carried by advection, and the mass that's carried by a mixture of molecular diffusion and me mechanical dispersion. And it's an important number in, in terms of some of the things we will do. I guess an important number here because you realize that it, it defines when this mechanical dispersion effect gets switched on. I guess you could tell from this that for Peclet numbers uh, less than one, it's uh, molecular diffusion. In other words, you're on this side of this regime, molecular diffusion. And for Peclet numbers greater than one, it is mechanical dispersion. So that's this one here. So lots of scrawled stuff, but I think you get the, the point. And so this is quite convenient for us because it allows us to, by not even thinking about it, using the correct magnitude of the velocity, automatically kick out the right magnitude of dispersion overall dispersivity that comes out of the system. This is for longitudinal one. In other words, the one that looks like this. And the one at the bottom is for the transverse one, which is the one that looks like this, which behaves in exactly the same way. See, only difference is longitudinal and transverse. These just come out of Fetter. I guess the book that you actually don't have, <laughs> but fine by me. And you see the same breakpoint. This is Peclet number of one. And you see it's kind of equal to one before that and kind of not equal to one after that. A bit of a curve in it. Perhaps this is a better curve. It goes through there. You get the picture. And so, um, so next time, what we'll do is we will use what we've got um, so far. It comes back to this first slide, really. So I don't really care that we know what this advection dispersion equation is or how to solve it, but to realize that physically these first two terms represent the beaker moving from here to the other side of the room and mixing occurring due, due to diffusion and mechanical mixing. This term representing the fact that I'm walking across to the other side of the room to deliver it. Uh, and this being this, and that therefore we can characterize all the behavior we want to see in terms of this. So starting uh, next week, not next week, we're meeting on Thursday, we'll start with the idea of one-dimensional flows so that we exactly take this geometry above to look like this, to get this curve here and here. Actually, that's not true. We only get this curve. We don't get this curve, right? 
And then after we've done that, we'll look at two-dimensional and three-dimensional flows to get exactly what this would look like. And we'll use this equation to do this. Uh, we'll quote the results. We won't solve it ourselves. And so that's on the agenda for, for next time.